right, so these are the 14 steps for a successful rehab. And I'm going to cover from the basics on these 14 steps. And in these 14 steps, we're going to cover the actual phases of construction as well. So step one is meet with your contractor and define the job. So once you have a property that you would like to purchase or like to acquire because it is in the threshold of your return that you're looking to meet, go ahead and meet your contractor and define the job on what you want done. Is it a simple, what I like to call lipstick on rehab, get in and get out, carpet paint stuff, or are you going to do some pretty heavy construction? And then from there, you got to define, step two is define the job and buy materials. The best way to go ahead and control the rehab is you should be buying the material. As you as an investor, as you progress and as you uh, mature in your flipping business, you are going to find that uh, to control the rehab construction aspect is you want to take over the material side. So if you have not done it yet, I would say that you should start immediately. If you are thinking about getting investing, I would say that, hey, you know what, you should definitely start with that in mind and hire contractors on strictly the labor portion and you buy the material. Because in our case with Capital Redevelopment Group, we do buy everything from the drywall to the screws and the wood for framing and so forth. So now once you define uh, uh, the actual project and this is where your creativity is going to come into play also because as I stated in the earlier in this presentation as competition heats up and you're in a uh, environment where the Wall Street hedge fund has entered into your business or entered into your local market area you're going to have to go ahead and do heavy construction and if you're going to do heavy construction uh, you want to make sure that you're controlling every aspect of the construction on top of that when you're defining the job you're creativity to be able to see the layout on how you want to go ahead and reconstruct the internal uh, walls of the house so that way the layout is much more smoother or if you're adding square footage uh, you need to go ahead and uh, bring in that creativity so that way you can go ahead and figure out what's the best layout of the home so once you figure that out then uh, you're going to start phase one or step three of the rehab process which is the demolition right you need to go ahead and demo out all the old ugly stuff and then step four of the rehab process is phase two of construction comes in which is the roof windows and siding and then step five is phase three of construction where you need to do plumbing and the H HVAC step six is phase four of construction which is framing in the subfloors Step seven of the rehab is phase five, or put up the sheet rock, the drywall, and so forth, right? As they say, mud, tape, orange peel, and paint. And step eight is phase six, which is the painting portion. And step nine of the rehab is phase seven of construction, which is the installing new kitchen and new bath. Uh, I would highly recommend that you actually have different subcontractors for installing the kitchen and the bath portion. And step 10 of a successful rehab and phase eight of the construction is your punch out list and step 11 is uh Phase 9 of your construction, which is the carpeting. Uh, step 12, the successful rehab, is phase 10, which is cleanup and landscaping. Now, a rule of thumb on landscaping is you can definitely start the landscaping in phase 1 of the demolition, uh, which means that when you clean it up, you can go and install the actual uh sprinklers so that way while you're going through phase two phase three phase four phase five phase six phase seven phase eight phase nine of your construction uh, if you already put the sprinklers in and you have the seeds in there uh, you should start to see grass grow uh, so that way you don't have to buy the expensive grass and so forth now step 13 of the successful rehab and phase 11 of a construction site is you need to even start marketing. So by that time, um, phase 11 will start marketing and looking for the end retail buyer and phase uh, a step 14, sorry, is phase 12 of the actual successful rehab, which is the final repairs that are required. And for us, for the final repairs, uh, we'll go ahead and independently order our own uh, home inspection report that we actually pay out of our pocket uh, to making sure that everything is uh, done correctly. Uh, so that way, if there are some issues with certain uh, plugs or certain things, then you will know that, hey, you know what? that portion was covered in the actual final inspection and uh, we can go ahead and give that ins home inspection report uh, over to our contractors to get it fixed. So again, 
step 14 or phase 12 of construction side is get a uh, property inspection report that you pay for so that way you can go ahead and uh, give that report to your contractor because one I guarantee you're probably going to find uh, something that needs to be fixed on there because we always do so uh, those are the 14 steps for successful rehab now here are a couple of case studies or videos sorry a couple of case study uh, projects that we have going on that has heavy Construction. And if you want to see some of our uh, videos from previous projects, go ahead and go to the link uh, that you see on the screen. And you can see, you know, this particular project, we're adding, a, you know, 500 square feet in the back, as you can see uh, here. It's being prepped, ready to actually pour concrete on. You can take a look here. The rebars are in, right? So here's another project that we have, right? And here's the back side of where we're adding the addition, right? Here it is, right? That's the little area that we're going to be adding. And you can see the backyard and you can see the greenness. Remember what I just talked to you about the, the sprinkler? So that's a prime example that the, the grass has grown, right? So, and uh, there it is, a better angle on the addition that we're doing. That's the whole master bedroom area that we're uh, putting together. Here's another project, right? And this one's a, a pretty big addition that we're doing. Uh, we're adding almost a thousand square feet on here so you can see here right the frame is going up all right there it is that's the big structure that we're adding in the back and here's another one uh with heavy construction right this one we built a brand new garage as you can see on the screen here they're building a, a brand new garage and the frame is up we even had to get a bobcat on that right so you can see the picture of that um, and uh, this one, we actually had to jack up the whole house, meaning that we had to lift it up, essentially picture a uh, jack that when you actually re change your tires on your car, right, you put a jack under your car to lift it up. We had to do the same thing because why? Because we did a new foundation on this. So uh, as you can see, there's the foundation. That's a better picture of it uh, where we actually poured new concrete and built a new foundation on the home. So. There you have it. Those are uh, some of the constructions that uh, is required, I believe, to stay competitive in this market to actually have a growing business. Otherwise, uh, you are going to get marginalized uh, by your competition, the six to eight billion dollar funds that are in your market. Right. So uh, that is the way to go ahead and get deals, right? Or sell deals to hedge funds or to be able to go ahead and do heavier construction. So that way the hedge funds are not going to uh, go ahead and uh, be able to buy those properties. So now let's talk about the second part, right? The capital aspect, right? Because you require two things to be very successful in, in a real estate investment uh, business or your flipping business. You need to have deals, right? You need to uh, have good enough deals that there's enough margin so that way you can make a profit. And on top of that, with deals comes capital. And when it comes to capital, it does not have to be your cold hard capital. Obviously, if you have your own uh, cold hard capital and you're liquid or you have a credit line, it's going to make your life much easier and your ability to be able to do this business much easier if you have like a home equity line of credit and so forth that you can tap into. But there are changes that are occurring at the micro and macro level uh, when it comes to capital side and how it's going to impact your business as well. Uh, what I mean by that is the same type of competition that is entering into our local market that's making our ability to be able to buy deals uh, at a discount is coming down. Same thing is going to happen with your capital side. So if you have capital on the sideline and you're lending it out to investor operators that are doing the actual flips, you are going to have to adjust to the market chain as well. And let me go ahead and explain that to you in a bit, right? So uh, do you know what happened on March 27th of 2012? Something very important occurred on that day. Now, what, is, what was it? It's the American Jobs Act. And the House overwhelmingly 
The House overwhelmingly approved the measure on Tuesday, March 27th of 2012, and this was a bipartisan measure and was backed by both parties, the left and right, and the White House, and passed 380 to 41 votes. Now, what is this job act? Now, if you want to go ahead and physically pull it up, go to www.getcrgnow.com forward slash job act, so that way you can pull it up on your screen while I'm explaining this to you, so that way you can see how it's going to impact your business. Now, now, within the Jobs Act, right, uh, how is it going to, what is the Jobs Act and why will it affect private investors and operator investors from making money? That's a question, right? A valid question. So pull it up on the Jobs Act, uh, you'll be able to see. And in the Jobs Act, what we're actually looking for is something called HR 2930 and aka crowdfunding. And that's the measure that's very important. So what is crowdfunding? Right now, if you want to know what crowdfunding is all about, go to www.getcrgnow.com forward slash crowdfunding. Now, in a nutshell, what crowdfunding is, is this, is that uh, it will allow anyone who's looking to raise capital to be able to raise capital openly in the public without going after accredited investors. Previously, for us investors, if we're going to raise capital in the form of PPM and so forth, private uh memorandums to raise capital for your investing business to create a let's just say a fund to compete with a hedge fund right you need to go after accredited investors now that's all going to change uh, with crowdfunding meaning that now you can pull anyone for capital raise meaning that if they have twenty thousand ten thousand fifty thousand or even ten bucks you can go ahead and pull those funds for a particular project and uh, my gut tells me okay is that this in itself is going to enter into the real estate investing. And this is my bold statement. You heard it here, you heard it here first, okay? Is crowdfunding is most likely going to enter into the local mom and pop investing. Why? Because it's going to be that much more easier to pull from uh, other investors, bunch of money together, and you don't have to worry about SEC violations and so forth on how you're raising capital. Now, in the later on in this presentation, I'll go into some of the things that you need to worry about and how you can structure those deals. But as I stated, crowdfunding will affect the way you raise capital. Why? Because it's going to allow average Joes, average small business owners to be able to go ahead and raise capital at a and to the open public openly, meaning that you don't even have to have a quote unquote relationship with the investors to be able to pitch a uh, deal or pitch a investment opportunity. So that's all going to be changed. Now, what are some other things, right, that it's going to affect private investors? Um, here's one, okay, is which we've been focused on. It's called EB-5 Visa. Now, if you don't know what an EB-5 Visa, here's the actual uh, Wikipedia definition of what EB-5 Visa is. And EB-5 Visa is like any other visa that you can get, meaning that you want to become a permanent resident of the United States of America. There's different visas that you can get. If you want to be a student, to come here and get education, right, or education, then you have to get an F-1 visa. If you're here to work, you get like a E-1 or H visa, right? Now, this one is specifically to promote investors from foreign countries, foreign nationals, to be able to invest in U.S. soil. So what is EB-5 visa, right? This visa provides a method of obtaining a green card for foreign nationals who invest money in the United States. And also, to obtain the visa, individuals must invest a million dollars or at least $500,000 in a targeted employment area, end quote, high unemployment or rural areas, creating or preserving at least 10 jobs for U.S. workers. So what does that mean? This means that the EB-5 visa can be used to go ahead and raise capital from foreign nationals, you know, to a million dollars or at least $500,000, as long as you can create a job in what they call, quote unquote, targeted employment areas. There's certain, obviously, qualifications on that. And the government basically tells you what that target employment area is. And it has to do with the unemployment rate and what's going on. Because why? Because the government wants to promote uh, job growth. So this is a way to promote job growth. Now, you may say, okay, 
what does this all mean? Well, let me go ahead and explain it to you, okay? Is uh, take a look at these pictures, right? It's from the W in Hollywood. And you can see the amazing pictures, right? And uh, this is an actual development that was created by a EB5 visa. And uh, it's, here's a site, a uh, screenshot of the site. And it's sold out exclusively by the American Dream Fund, the W Hotel in Hollywood. So the actual W Hotel in Hollywood, um, where celebrities go and so forth, and people have amazing parties and so forth, and it's, it's a fun place to be, is, was created by using the EB5 visa. Right. And if you want to find out more about it, go to the www.adreamfund.com forward slash investment underscore project dot PHP. And you can go ahead and literally read up on this particular development. So if you're competing um, with these hedge funds, right, to buy properties for the deal side. Now, when it comes to capital and you have capital on the sideline to invest, you're also going to be competing with these types of government programs that are coming out to promote job growth and you're competing with international investors, right? Now, let's take a look here. Here's a, an article from Asia, Asia Society, right? If you take a look here and you can see on the headline, Chinese direct investment in California. And this article breaks down uh, literally what the growth of Chinese foreign investors that have entered into California. And they talk about, and they say Asian society finds that California has attracted more Chinese investment deals than any other U.S. state and remains fifth in the nation in total investment value. And it also goes on to say Chinese investment in the state is growing at triple digit levels and could reach 60 billion by 2020. So that means there are more money now from international investors coming in that you have to compete with as investor operators. Now, obviously, if you're an investor operator, meaning that means that you have more choices and options to turn to when it comes to uh, finding the right capital uh, to do your real estate investment deals, right? So then the question is, right, um, obviously you can go here, you know, get crgnow.com forward slash Asia dash society dash executive summary to actually read up on the executive summary that was created by Asia Society and, and uh, that explains why there's that much growth and so forth. It's a very interesting, interesting article. I would highly recommend for you to uh, read it as well. Now, why is that happening, right? Why is international uh, investors coming? My opinion is this, is that uh, the U.S. dollar has been declining in terms of purchasing power during the 20th century. And this is an actual uh, graph that actually breaks this down. And as you can clearly see, since, since even you know, the Great Depression, the value has been coming down. And obviously, previously, uh, during the Great Depression, it, it was considered the great contraction, as they say, right? That the funds that were in the economy um, contracted, meaning there was less capital. So that's why there were, quote, unquote, bank runs and so forth. I can, you know, that's for a whole other webinar explaining all that. But um, since then, uh, the dollar has always been pegged by gold, meaning that it was a, on what they call a gold standard. So for every dollar that you had, it was considered to be, uh, you can have an equivalent to a gold, right? Same thing as they call it the silver dollar, right? One ounce of gold and so forth, right? But things has changed since then, meaning that uh, during the Vietnam War, uh, this country de-pegged itself from the actual gold that it was backed backed by. It was done by Richard Dick Nixon at that time, and they unlinked it from the gold. Why? Because uh, the country needed more liquidity, needed an ability to be able to uh, print more money, as they say, so that way we can fund the wars and so forth. Now, obviously, after that, we went through a big stagflation era, right? Jimmy Carter era, where interest rates were in the high teens. So anyone that lived through that time will remember, right, that you're buying houses in triple digits, uh, not triple digits, sorry, double digits, interest rates, and so forth. Then we got the Gulf War, then we got the war on terrorism. But as you can clearly see, the dollar has been declining, meaning that foreign investors can buy more of U.S. stuff or U.S. investments because of the U.S. carry trade and the strength of the dollar declining. So 
understand all of this and what's going on, at least on the global scale, and what's happening with our currency, because it is going to impact you as a private investor who's looking to investor capital. Because an investor operator who's doing the rehab flips and so forth, they have now options to tap into these money sources. So if they have options to tap into these money sources, your previous investor operator that you entrusted over the course of several years or several months or whatever it is to get you those returns that you've gotten, you may not be able to get it. Why? Because of one, your investor operators who's doing the flips are now competing with uh, institutional funds like a hedge fund. And on top of that, they're looking to keep their same margins. And if they're looking to keep the same margin, they're going to find ways to cut expenses. And if the financing side is not follow suit, as they say, then you're going to most likely have more capital on the sideline than you can go ahead and invest in real estate. So understand this global change, what's going on. But now let's go ahead and talk about the basic stuff. And what I'm going to cover are the common ways to structure your private money deals. And as I kind of explained earlier in the presentation, I always like to teach from the ground level, right? Give you the basics. And what I'm going to cover is the common ways to structure, structure your private money deals and how we're doing it in our business and the way that we used to do it and why we're no longer doing it. And on top of that, uh, we'll cover a couple of cases studies on uh, what we're doing in our business and how you can get involved as well. So what are the common ways? There's three ways, in my opinion, or three forms of capital that you can tap into. Number one is bank financing, right? Well, what is bank financing? Type one is conventional lenders like Fannie Freddie, right? The, the good old GSEs, right? Government-sponsored entities now that is owned by American tax dollars <laughs> since, since we bailed them out in, back in 08, right? And there's a limit of those. You can only have 10 mortgage properties, right? So if you're an investor operator looking to cash flow properties or use bank financing, you can get only up to 10 loans. Very strict financing guidelines and requires tons of paperwork, okay? You gotta have good credit. So if you have been affected in uh, the actual downturn of 08 uh, when the market crashed and you don't have good credit, then you're gonna be in trouble. And on top of that, you need to require 20 to 30% down payment on that. And a note from your doctor, Doctor, personality test, blood type, and you get the idea, right? It's very hard to qualify these days, especially for investors, okay? And especially if you're an investor who uh, does this as their full-time job, meaning that your income is flipping homes, right? Uh, they like W-2 employees. If you're a W-2 employee that have a full-time job with very good income, it's much easier for you to uh, qualify for this. But as an investor, it's going to be much more difficult. Now, what's the type two of bank financing? Portfolio lenders, local community banks, and credit unions, which we like because there's less restriction because loans are generally kept in-house, hence in portfolio, right? And it still must qualify based on income, credit, global cash flow, and balance sheet of your company and yourself. And mostly commercial lenders, which means loans carry short-term calls of three, five, 10 years, or they'll reset uh, in those time frames, right? Meaning that they will go ahead and balloon. So those are the two types when it comes to bank financing. You can use a Freddie Fannie style, or you can use a portfolio lender. So what are the other ways out of the three ways of financing or three sources. Two is hard money. So if you're an investor operator looking to flip, you can use hard money. So what is hard money? A hard money will typically charge you two to four points up front or in the back end and eight to 12 percent interest rates, right? And it must have an assured exit strategy and a very solid deal before taking on hard money, meaning that uh, hard money lenders um, only take on great deals and terms and rate vary on experience and risk and experience will go very 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 deep meaning that if you have proven track record with a hard money lender that experience will allow you to go ahead and get deals and get financing much quicker than if you were to go ahead and do your first deal. And now, obviously, if you're going to build relationships uh, with hard money lenders, I would say become very selective and start building relationship with the big boys of the hard money lenders. Why? Because they're going to give you more leverage, in my opinion, as long as they know that, hey, you can perform and they can go ahead and make special arrangements with you, okay? Now, see what these hard money lenders are offering. Why? Because I want to show you what 
uh, folks are offering in this market because things has drastically changed since 08 uh, when hard money lenders are very conservative. In my opinion, now hard money lenders are very aggressive and the lending side has changed even in the last six months to 12 months. And I want to go ahead and show you exactly what has changed and show you some of the folks that we work with locally here in Los Angeles when it comes to fr uh, funding our deals. So here's one company, Polaris Equity Group. And you can see here the loan structure. They go up to loan to value of 60% based on after repair appraisal and up to 65% on case by case basis, meaning that uh, depending on your experience and so forth. So these folks will go above your purchase price if your after repair value is significantly higher, meaning that they'll cover 60% of your after repair, including all points rehab costs and so forth. So if your loan amount includes your repair amount, points, closing costs, holding costs, and so forth, and it's under 60% of after repair value, essentially you got yourself a 100% funded deal. Now, obviously, you still have to uh, make mortgage payments, so there's going to be some carrying costs on that, right? But if you want to get hold of these folks, uh, here's the contact information to Polaris, uh, the folks that we work with, uh, Dan Lymel Jr., he's the CEO of it, and here's the address. They're out in Laguna Hills, and his phone number is 949-727-4333 with extension 4481, or you can shoot them an uh, email at dan at polarisequitygroup.com. Um, let them know that uh, we sent you Capital Redevelopment Group, uh, so that way you can make sure that uh, you're taken care of. But those are the folks that uh, uh, you can get an app and see how much they're willing to cover on a deal, right? Um, here's some couple other people, right, that we work with. Anchor Loans, right? They're one of the uh, big hard money lenders here locally in Southern California. And you can see here on Anchor Loans, Anchor Loans generally do not exceed 70% of after repair value of the property security loan. So they go up uh, anywhere from 5 to 10% more higher in terms of after repair value. Uh, so it can potentially mean less money out of your pocket uh, or skin in the game meaning that you get a very high debt leverage, right? Which is a good thing for investor operators. Why? Because flipping houses or rehabbing is a very labor intensive business and also a cash heavy business, meaning that you have to have a lot of cash on your sideline to be able to grow your business, right? So, but if you want to go ahead and get hold of Anchor Loans, get hold of Robert Fragoso, he's the executive VP or vice president there, and they're out in Cerritos and you can call them at 310-395-0010 and ask for Robert or shoot them an email at robertf at anchorloans.com. Or, you know, you can ask for Rick Perez. Rick Perez is a gentleman I, I love doing business with, and you can speak with him, and he can help you out also. Uh, so give him a call. Like I said, tell him that uh, uh, we sent you, so that way you can make sure that uh, uh, you're being taken care of, right? So uh, this particular lender goes up to 70%. Now, here's another one, right? Aztec Financial. They are another, you know, old hard money lender company out here in Los Angeles. And you can see here on their website, they say, we may lend up to 100% of purchase price plus 100% of the cost of repairs, subject to appraisal, any type of residential commercial property. And I can vouch uh, for Aztec, you know, uh, that they have funded 100% of our deals in the past. And they're very easy to work with. And one of my favorites, why? Because they're actually out in Burbank, uh, which is very close to our location headquarters of Hollywood so if you want to get hold of them you can uh, get hold of Joel Hoffman who is the actual CEO and owner or you can go ahead and call him at 818-848-8960 and ask for our guy that we work with who is Efren so uh, contact Efren and be like hey you know what uh, capital redevelopment group sent you and have them uh, essentially uh, see how much they can lend you on your next deal right now, here's another one, right? This is just an email that I just literally got uh, a few few minutes ago. And uh, look at here, right? These folks goes up to 75% of after repair value, meaning that it's additional 5% more than anchor loans or more than 5 to 10% or even 15% of the other guys that I just mentioned. Now, why is that significant when it comes to capital outlay as an investor operator looking to grow their business? It is this, is that if you have a delta of 10% difference, meaning that let's just say you're acquiring properties at $200,000 and your average aggregate loan amount is 200,000, that 10% equates to about $40,000, right? 
uh, am I doing, no, I'm sorry. That, yeah, that would equate, that would equate to $40,000. No, I did the math wrong on that. I'm sorry. It equates to uh, $20,000 a cash outlay. Now, obviously, if your price point, the median price point is at $400,000, like most of our acquisition price, then that $20,000 is now Forty thousand. So imagine if you have four deals uh, that you're working on right now on rehabbing. That means that you have to have a, an aggregate cash position or liquid cash is four hundred thousand dollars that you need to have in equity position in your deals. Uh, meaning that you have to at least bring to the closing table to close on those deals and to operate. And that. Uh, $400,000, right? Well, what I'm doing is 40,000 times uh, 10, which is $400,000. That does not include new deals that you're tying up, right? Because as competition heats up, you need to go ahead and put bigger EMDs, right? We're putting EMDs of $10,000 sometimes, even $20,000 and so forth, just so we can get the deal. So if you have, you know, 10 different escrows open at $10,000, that's another $100,000 that you have open uh, in cash outlay that you have. So total aggregate at that time is $500,000 million dollars right so you can see that it's a cash heavy business so if you're an investor operator you're constantly looking for ways to leverage your dollars so that way you have the least amount of capital out right and on top of that that's very interesting about this email that I got just recently is this it says I'm looking to earn your business back we just raised some international capital and I think you'll love this program see below so as I stated earlier in this presentation is that international investors are coming into California, coming into your local market. This is a prime example of a hard money lender stating that he just raised capital from international people. And because of that, my gut tells me they're uh, after repair or total loan to value uh, CLTV, they can go up to 75% of after repair value, right? So hard money lenders. Right. Stay competitive, know what's going on and uh, focus on leverage much as you can without going without uh, becoming over leveraged, as they say. So now the third thing when it comes to capital is private money, which we love the most. So what is private money? Uh, borrowing from individuals. Obviously, it can be from LLC that an individual owns, but typically from individuals and very few regulations. Right. It's more on the how you solicit, not in terms of how we borrow the money, but it's more on how you solicit for uh, private capital that's always been regulated. Right. Now, as I stated, with crowdfunding coming into play, it's going to become that much more easier to raise capital for investors. And on top of that, document requires are totally up to the lenders and usually the title company and they're flexible terms and can fund as fast as the private money investor can move or how fast that they can go ahead and wire and terms and rates are totally up to the private money investor meaning that hedge funds and hard money folks right has a certain yield that they have to hit so if they have to hit a certain yield they can they have to charge you the actual investor operators who's doing the flip more than what they're borrowing for so that way they can make a spread on the interest rate right what they're charging in the points and so forth so that way they can stay profitable but when it comes to private money since you are not paying a fund you're not you don't have underlining you know yields that you need to hit yes obviously private individuals are going to have yields that they want to hit you know returns that they want to get but it's going to be up to the private money investor right so in a typical private money transaction, you, the borrower or the investor operator, receives a loan for X from the private lender in exchange for a monthly interest payment based on X. Now, that interest payment can be rolled into the back end to be paid all up in the back end side, or it can be paid as monthly cash flow to you as the private investor. And a deed of trust or a mortgage on the property will be recorded against the property depending on your state. California is a deed of trust state, so if you were to do deals with us, we record a what they call a deed of trust against the property and we'll go ahead and give you a promissory note uh, for the amount of the loan and promising to repay the loan after the agreed term so that's what we have now the big idea as a private lender investor is you decide what terms and rate fits your risk tolerance level that fits your financial goals and timeline right why because it's your investment it's your capital you worked hard for it so you make the rules it's your capital Right. So 
Now, in the most typical private money transaction where an investor rehabs and flips a house, the lender funds either all or most of the purchase and renovation. And the goal is to find deals so cheap in relation to the after repair that the lender is protected. And in our company never go over 80% of after repair value, including points, interest fees, closing costs, rehab costs, holding costs, and etc. Now, in that 80%, we're going to also include the monthly payment as well. And we want to make sure that we stay under the 80% threshold of after repair value. Why? Because you want to have an equity position for your private money capital investors for protection, right? Because if you have no equity position whatsoever, or you have less than 20%, then you're going to put your private money investor in a position where their funds are going to be at a higher risk, right? So always, always remember that you need to go ahead and protect your private capital investor and never go over the 80%. Now, but oftentimes a private lender investor will say things like may not have, or, or sorry, they may not be comfortable with that much risk and require you to put a skin into the game, a little or a lot. And why? Because they're risk averse, right? They want to make sure that uh, you have some risk on there also and may not be happy with the interest rate you're offering and want a higher return or they have a higher risk appetite, right? So those are the two things that's going to happen with private uh, capital investors. Either one, they're going to say, okay, ooh, seems like a little bit too much risk for me or they're going to want a higher uh, return, right? Now, for me, the return to your private lender gets typically or should be commensurate with the risk that they take on, right? Because obviously if they're taking on higher risk or a higher probability of a risk or perceived risk, as I like to call it, then you should compensate them for a higher return versus a low risk, low, low return, right? So that old thing, low risk, low return, high risk, high return, right? So um, what can you do? Well, the, first off, you need to understand the risk tolerance level of your investors. Here's a quick diagram, right, uh, for operator investors, right, and for private money lender investors. And in the middle is essentially your, your risk tolerance blend because each investor, regardless if you're an operator investor, meaning you're doing the flip yourself or you're a private money lender investor who's just lending out capital, that blend of risk tolerance needs to be blended. And that middle ground is the actual uh, place where you're going to agree in terms of the return rate and what makes sense for both parties. So on this diagram for operator investors, what is it? It's capital growth, right? Operator investors are looking for capital growth. They're looking for the highest ROI, max leverage, control, most profits, flexibility, the cost, and the speed of decision. Those are the key points for operator investors uh, when it comes to looking for private money capital. Why? Because they're looking for capital growth. They're trying to grow their business. They're looking for the highest ROI, just like any investor, regardless if they're a private money lender investor or an operator investor. They want to have control. Why? Because the uh, more control that you have, the higher success rate of uh, being a successful deal. They're looking for most profits, flexibility, and cost. And the big one is speed of decision. Uh, we want to work with private money lender investors that can make decisions very quickly. Why? Because deals are made and deals are lost in matter of minutes and hours, especially in this market now as things have become more competitive. Things that need to move quicker needs to move faster than ever before. And funding is one part of it, right? So for private money in investors, uh, what, what are their concerns? Capital preservation, right? You worked hard for your dollars. You built that little nest egg. You're trying to preserve your capital. You're obviously looking for highest ROI, highest leverage. You're looking for max leverage. You want to have control. You're looking for most profits, flexibility. And also the big key part is you're looking for operator experience, right? So if you're lending capital, the soldiers that you've built, right, the dollars that you've uh, built over the coat, the over the course of the years or so, you want to make sure that they're protected, right? Capital preservation is number one. And then also number two is going to be operator experience. So when you're entrusting an operator uh, like us or other operator investors who's doing the flipping business, you want to make sure that your dollars are safe. And for it to be safe, you really have to look in the experience level of an investor, okay? So that's a quick diagram. And now here's a nifty little chart that I made, which is what I like to call the risk versus return chart. And uh, 
and what you need to pay attention to. And uh, obviously, the low LTV or low debt that you're going to have, lower the amount, uh, you're going to have a lower return, right? And obviously, as the interest or potential return increases, as you can see on the chart, then it may change. You might have a higher loan to value. You might do some type of equity debt uh, split, or you might do an equity deal with them. Now, if you don't know what all of that equity and debt means, uh, Debt in terms of finances means that you're taking out a loan. Equity means that you actually have a position of a, a profit share, let's just say, of the flip. So uh, that's the easy way for me to explain it. Now, what to consider? Loan to value. Very important, right? Obviously, clearly, higher loan to uh Loan to value uh, can mean potentially higher risk, not always, but also at the same time, it can also equate to potential higher return as well. Now, obviously, the experience is very important because you need to consider the experience level of the operator investors because an operator investor who only flips one house every quarter or something like that is going to pay most likely probably a lot higher interest rate versus a seasoned uh, flipping business that's been around for one, two, three years like us. Why? Because we have a, a team, a bigger team that we have to pay out on. So if we have to pay out on folks that are on the team, we need to make sure that uh, that uh, uh, the investor's capital can get paid also and also that we can stay profitable as well. So typically with seasoned investors, you're going to pay a little bit less than uh, uh, your mom and pop investor that's doing one or two deals a quarter. But obviously with a seasoned company, your funds should be essentially more secure or more protected. Why? Because they've done more flips and they have more experience, right? And also the big one is direction of the company, in my opinion, because this window of opportunity to capitalize on this historic lows of this real estate market, um, it, this window of opportunity is closing and it's closing very quickly. So the direction of, of the company is very important because if you have only deals and the operators aren't looking to expand or grow their business and you have, you know, a couple of hundred thousand or even several million dollars on the sideline, then the operator investor may only be able to go ahead and lend, you know, use or uh, use only a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars worth of your capital versus a company that's looking to expand and do bigger deals and so forth, right? So I hope that makes sense. Now let's go over the four common ways to structure your private capital. As I stated, the first most common way is low LTV debt, right? Lenders fund 50% of both acquisition and rehab or the lenders fund acquisition and no rehab. So those are the low LTVs, uh, meaning that uh, you have to bring a significant amount of capital to the closing table uh, for you uh, to be able to borrow from private cap, uh, private investors like that. Now, as I stated, hard money lenders are becoming very aggressive. You know, you saw one that's 75% of uh, uh, after repaired value. So if you're a private capital investor and you're saying, hey, I only want that position of 50%, well, don't expect to make that same type of return as a hard money lender when a hard money lender is uh, lending out more capital. So as you can see, your return is going to be significantly lower. Now, higher LTV debt, right? Um, the hard money lenders are, uh, you know, obviously plus 60%, 65 and 75% on some. So uh, keep that in mind and lenders fund everything with a straight interest or lenders fund everything with rolling in uh, closing costs and holding costs. And this is your highest loan to value debt. And this is typically our method of uh, working with private investors uh, where we'll go ahead and have one investor on one property and have them fund 100% of the actual transaction and we'll pay them typically close to what we're paying hard money lenders. Why? Because in our case, we want to go ahead and build relationship with private investors. Uh, why? Because we're looking to expand our company, expand our business, and we're going to run across other deals uh, that a hard money lender may not lend on and we want to have the flexibility uh, from the private capital investors to be able to uh, to get into those deals later on in this real estate cycle as the market shifts again. So the other way is debt and equity, right? Lenders fund everything with the interest and profit split. 
uh, debt and equity, which is smaller profit. Uh, we do do some equity deals. Uh, uh, we don't do uh, too much equity splits, meaning that we don't do like 50-50 split on equity deals. Why? Because there's too much work involved for our side to find a deal, especially with the competition that's heating up. And on top of that, uh, we do have a significant amount of folks that are on payroll that we need to pay out. So we need to stay profitable. Now, I'm not saying that if you're if you have capital on the sideline, uh, are you going to be able to get profit share? Yeah, you could probably get profit shares from uh, other rehabbers, um, but keep in mind that uh, those rehabbers may be brand new and they're just starting or uh, they have a smaller operation. So if you have a war chest of capital that you need to uh, go ahead and uh, uh, get returns on, you may not be able to do that, uh, especially if that uh, operator investor is only buying one house every quarter, right? So a uh, debt and equity, to keep that in mind, probably the best bet to do that with ours is uh, what we do is we give a prep rate on the hard cost for the, for the debt. If a private investor is leveraging debt, uh, we'll go ahead and do a prep rate on that. So that way that's a delta wash, meaning that we'll pay for the actual debt on what it's costing them, and then we'll split equity from there. Right. So now the other way to do this is 100% equity. Uh, I know some investors in my local area that does this. That makes sense for them. Why? Because they look at uh, the actual transaction itself as four phases, right, If uh, of, of the business, meaning that uh, phase one is finding the deal, right? Phase two is finding the capital for the deal. Phase three is the actual construction. And phase four is uh, – disposition, right? Uh, getting it and actually realizing the profits. So they look at the capital uh, being one out of the four aspects. So if someone wants to fund 100% of the deal, I've seen other investors actually split that into quarters, right? Which kind of makes sense. For some, it may not. Um, but it does, as I stated, for private money uh, capital investors, it's totally up to uh, the investors themselves to have that conversation with the actual investor operators to negotiate that. Because why? Because it's real estate, it's everything is negotiable. So those are the four common ways to structure private capital. Now, what do we do in our business? And uh, this is how you can get involved with us. Um, what we do with our business is when we start to negotiate to acquire property, we have a database of private capital investors who has funds on the side that are looking to invest in real estate. And if what we do is once we have a property under contract and something that we want to move forward with, we'll send out what we call a lender opportunity package uh, that requests the funding for the deal, including the comps and all the deals details. And uh, once you receive that package, you're going to be able to analyze it and say, okay, yeah, you know what, this one kind of makes sense. This is my cup of tea. This is what I want to do. And essentially from there, it goes into step three, uh, which is the letter of commitment that you will send to us uh, stating that, hey, you can fund the deal. And then from there, it goes into step four or the finish where we'll go ahead and get hold of the closing agent, prepare the doc set, lender approves the certified funds to the closing agent, wires it in, and all documents are signed and transaction is complete. So that's essentially the cycle of our business. When we have a deal, we send it out to our private capital investors. Now, let me show you quickly on what our lender opportunity packet looks like. So that way you can get a good feel of what it's all about. Here's one right now um, called Project Delmar uh, that we're working on. As you can see here, this is the front cover. And you can see here the headline, what an opportunity to bring back to life this 2200 square feet Mediterranean Revival located in the coveted Caltech neighborhood in Pasadena. We are currently restoring its old charm and adding today's contemporary modern design. This project will be one of those deals you'll simply fall in love with. Invest and watch this transformation of turning this home back to elegance. So you can see here this one we already started construction on. As you can see, this one already been uh, brown coated on there, clear coated, I'm sorry. And uh, our packet will break down the overview on it, right? The project description, right? It gives you that. The work required. And on top of that, we'll give you the purchase rehab and the assumptions on here, right? What we're doing, uh, how much the rehab cost is. As you can see, $160,000 that we're putting into this project already. Uh, project and the total aggregate. This is a, a total aggregate of all the costs and all the hard costs. We're at 73%. Remember that magical number that I said 80%? This one's 73%, right? And here's some pictures of it, right? And here's the actual request that we uh, sent over to our investors. You can see this one is for gap funding or mezzanine financing that we're requesting. And as you can see here, uh, we're requesting 97000 
$406.69 in a time frame of five months. And projected resale uh, low price is 985 all the way to project the high as 1.1 million. So as you can see here, for our calculation, we use 985, which is on the lower end. Why? Because we always like to stay conservative on our numbers, because obviously if you get a higher one, you know, awesome, but you want to stay conservative. And this breaks down the actual investment opportunity. And this one says CRG has pro purchased the property in 823-2012. Project has already started construction. We are in phase three of construction with demo framing, electrical plumbing, drywall, AC installed. We're looking for gap investor financing of 977. Term is five months for, in this case, we're paying out 12 points at 11,000, secured by a second deed of trust and promissory notes. So uh, when, it, when you look at the actual return wise, cash on cash is 12. And if you look at an annualized return of 28%. So uh, our investors that will actually invest on these particular deals has been folks that may have been in the past flipping themselves, but you know it's become more difficult for them to find deals or uh, they rather entrust folks like us uh, to do the deals. And obviously in the annualized return wise, we're, you know, they're almost at 30%. So that's probably much closer to what they were doing if they were to go ahead and do their flips themselves, right? So this is kind of the actual packet. And here's the comparable report, right? We actually put the comps in here uh, with pictures and so forth. And here's more pictures of the actual deal in itself. You can see here the front view inside, right? We did the roof, new fencing, everything else. And this is what we send out to our private capital investors. So if you're interested, in uh, any of our particular uh, things that we went over today on this particular webinar, there should be a link that pops up somewhere on the screen or at the end of the webinar where you can go ahead and put your name and your email address. Uh, so that way we can go ahead and put you as one of the interested parties uh, in our uh, projects that we have. So take a look there. And uh, we're coming to an end, okay, of this particular uh, webinar. I know we covered so many things, but here is our question answer phase because we've seen since this long webinar, a lot of question has been coming in. So I'm going to try to answer all of your question at this moment. So if you had any questions whatsoever, feel free to type them in right now. Uh, so that way uh, we can get them all answered. So uh, type them in now. All right, so uh, we're getting a lot of questions uh, from folks right now, and uh, one of the questions I'm reading right here is stating that, uh, Jeff, I, I saw that. Uh, what, what are some of the actual hedge funds that are entering into the Los Angeles? Uh, can you give me some examples? Now, I... Uh, I don't like to give out names. Why? Because it's going to dramatically impact our business if we were to go ahead and give out the names of the hedge funds. But I will go ahead and give it out since, uh, you know, if you just Google hedge funds, you can easily find the company's name. Is uh, Colony Capital is one has entered in, into our local market. Uh, they're actually uh, start off in Santa Monica and the owners are in Santa Monica also, but they've been buying properties out in uh, Atlanta, Phoenix, uh, and I believe Memphis or so, uh, but so forth. But now they have moved over into Los Angeles County. Previously to this, I believe they were out in Riverside, San Bernardino buying up properties, but now they're moving over uh, to the Los Angeles County that uh, I've actually seen them make an offer on our wholesale deal. So uh, obviously you can sell to them if you like and so forth but or the easiest bet maybe is if you're looking to wholesale and you have a deal just email us at deals at get and we can do a cold call selling and we can sell it for you and we can uh you know split profits that way so that's one way that you can get involved so i hope i answered your question um here's another question that i have uh what type of list did i go after uh on uh the actual foreclosure list. Well, the one that we go after, and I'll openly say why, because it's a changing market and some of the strategies that we've been using in the last year has not been as effective, um, but also at the same time, um, I like to give good value, so I'll answer that question. Um, the list that we went after on that case study that we originally showed on how we acquired that property uh, was a foreclosure list that we went after. It was a foreclosure. We're in the state of California, Southern California. Uh, so uh, when a foreclosure, when a homeowner 
falls behind on their mortgage payment, three, six, nine months, the bank has the right to go ahead and file a document called the notice of default against the property. Now, once a notice of default gets filed against the property, it becomes public information. So we have a source uh, that we go ahead and pull the data from, and we send out these postcards to folks that are in foreclosure and with equity, meaning that they have an equity position of at least 25%. Uh, from what we like to call the the AVM model or the automated valuation model, right? The the model that the big banks use or what Zillow uses, taking the local area and the square footage and chopping it up by the actual subject property, and then boom, X, you have a value, quote unquote. So we use that value, and as long as you have 75% equity position from that AVM, uh, we're sending them a postcard. Uh, so we went after those folks, and the deal that we got from uh, that case study that you just saw uh, and the inbound call that my acquisition team took uh, was based strictly on that lead. So you can, you know, pull that from your local title guys or, or you know, we'll go ahead and give you a, a uh, overview of the shorted version of this webinar with transcript on it. I'll kind of give you a resource page. How about that? Um, it's showing you exactly where we got it. So uh, that's, that's one way. Now, here's another question. It's kind of, oh man, we're getting so much questions right now. So uh, just keep on typing in your question. We'll get them all answered. Yeah, so here's another question. It is stating that, uh, oh no, I guess it's a statement. You know, I guess this person is, is in uh, Phoenix and he's saying the same thing. Hey, I, Jeff, hey Jeff, thanks for the webinar. Uh, I see the big hedge funds entering into Phoenix also and it has made my life much more difficult and my income has been cut 50% on it. But luckily enough, uh, he says that he's doing heavy construction now. So finally, he's doing less deals, but may almost making the same money as he did two years ago. So that's, I think that's, he wrote a long, long sentence. So I kind of paraphrased it there. So uh, that's awesome. So if you made those shifts in your business, that's perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a question on the construction. He says, what is the typical time frame of getting a, a building permit out? Well, it's going to really depend on your building and safety, right? And there's two ways to do this. And it might be different in other parts of the country, but I'm, I'm talking from experience from Los Angeles is there's two ways to go ahead and get permits. One is called over-the-counter, or the second one is called uh, the regular submission channel. Now, over-the-counter, just like the word over-the-counter, when you get drugs, right? I'm not talking about drugs but prescription drugs from pharmacies when you get an over-the-counter drug it's just you just have a slip and you go and boom you can get the count of the drugs very easily so the same way when it comes to over-the-counter permits as long as you have your structural calc uh uh calculation on your plans and everything else you can literally get it approved by building and safety in matter of days uh, versus weeks or months if it's uh, over the counter so obviously over the counter means that there needs to be less uh, construction work so that's why we try to keep our additions on a very boxy way so that way it comes out easily right and uh, uh, obviously other cities, it's going to take much longer. What I've noticed is incorporated cities, meaning smaller cities, will take much longer uh, for them to approve uh, permits for some odd reason. I don't know why. Uh, we always get a boiler uh, plate uh, type of response, which is, well, our typical uh, submission page is four to six weeks. So we have up to six weeks to go ahead and review your plans or something of that nature, right? So expect that expect that it's going to take that long. I would say even expected that it might take one or two months. So what I would highly recommend for you to do is calculate that in your construction costs, calculate that in your holding costs, and calculate it so that way you know that, hey, you know what, if you are going to do heavy construction, at least you even let your investors know who's your investor operator on the type of deal that they're doing, and hey, it might take. Because, you know, realistically, uh, to turn your capital six months you know, every six months has become increasingly more difficult. And I don't see too many investors doing that. All right, here, here, here's an interesting question. Uh, how many times do you turn uh, your capital? Well, as I stated, for us is we're doing it maybe on a six to nine month time frame. 
Okay, I haven't looked at the last report on that, so I don't have the exact number, but it's becoming increasingly more difficult. Previously, we were able to do uh, every six months, we were turning investors' capital, meaning that we were able to do it twice a year, turning it. Sometimes we we're doing it, uh, uh, you know, two and a half two and a half times a year, meaning that with investors' capital, we can flip them multiple times. So our investors are getting paid three times in a year. But it's becoming more increasingly more difficult. Why? Because the heightened competition and uh, more capital being readily available and so forth. And so it's becoming more difficult. So just expect that. If, in my opinion, if someone is telling you that, uh, that they're turning their capital four times in a year, I think they're full of it. You know, especially if they're in Los Angeles. If they're doing that, I would love to talk to them and I would love to go ahead and give them hundreds of thousands of dollars so that way they can show me how they're doing it because I don't see how mathematically they're doing it in Los Angeles. They're turning it four times. So, all right. So the next question is if, if you would... Okay, now here it is. If you would like to get involved on some of the deals that we have, as I stated, there should be a link somewhere on the screen where you can go ahead and... Uh, fill out uh, a form so that we can get more information on our, our, our investment opportunities that we have. So go ahead and click on that button. That's probably the best bet. Uh, so that way we can go ahead and break that down to you. Now, more questions are coming in. Okay, there's a question on crowdfunding. Uh, okay, this it's a very technical question, um, but they actually said, please be more detailed on how crowdfunding is going to affect the real estate market. Uh, you know, I can be detailed as possible, but all I can say is this, is that just imagine the pool of investors that previously when you were raising capital, you had to go through specific channels to raise capital. And there was a specific way to raise capital because of SEC regulation. Now with crowdfunding, uh, the, the door is wide open. You can essentially create a, a placement, a private you know placement up to a million dollars uh, without following these types of filings that we had to do before when it comes to raising capital. So that's going to be out the window. So crowdfunding is really uh, was created for online businesses, right? Uh, meaning that folks that would post a job on uh, a website and look for funders that will go ahead and fund it and they'll go ahead and pull in uh, multiple investors' money to fund that particular project. And that's what crowdfunding is all about. But what I'm saying is it's going to impact uh, your real estate investors because right now, I'll say it again, is I'm actually testing it out with a company uh, right now called Go Big Network uh, that actually is kind of have like a crowdfunding platform, not really in a sense of a real crowdfunding platform, but it allows you to post projects of uh, uh, rehab projects. And we've been posting on there to test the market to see if the market will go ahead and even invest. And we've gotten a uh, very, very high responses from other investors that, that are actually accustomed to investing in deals like that. That's why I see the trend. And those are the changes that I see. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Okay. So this one's more very specific. What type of returns do you pay uh, your investors? Well, it, it really depends. It depends on where we're at in the construction phase and it depends uh, what type of transaction it is. Right. If it's obviously a heavier construction and uh, we're just going to buy the property and it's from the get go, the, the acquisition price, and you're going to fund 100 percent of this, then we're going to pay a lot higher in terms of point wise and maybe uh, interest and point wise. So that way we can give you a solid return. But also at the same time, since you're taking it on, quote unquote, a higher risk, right, because uh, you're essentially coming 100 percent of the acquisition, 100 percent of the rehab costs and so forth. So we're going to pay that out, obviously. If we buy it with our own capital, right, and we're already 50% of construction is completed and we're raising it, uh, the capital to get liquidity back in our, our company, then, then we're going to pay out probably less. Why? Because there really isn't any risk, right? We've done cases where we buy properties and we own it outright with all cash and it's an easy cookie cutter deal and we're not going to do a refi cash out with a private investor until we're done with construction 100%. Right. So that way we can roll our funds into a new project. So it really depends. Now, if you want specific points, because I see you asking me what the specific points are. Well, they can range from uh, anywhere from two points at eight uh, percent up to four points at 12 percent uh, up to gap funders uh, getting anywhere from one point a month all the way up to uh, three points a month. 
So it really depends. So as I stated, if you're interested, you know, let's get on the phone. I can go ahead and explain that to you. Uh, so just go ahead and click on that link on the screen and you'll be able to get more information that way. How can you get involved? You're a real estate agent and uh, you want to bring us deals? Oh, perfect. If you want to bring us deals, uh, with all means, just email it to us at deals at getcrgnow.com. So that way our acquisition team can go ahead and uh, run the numbers on it uh, and uh, see if it makes sense for us. Obviously, more information you give us, the better we can get back to you. There is typically about a 24 to 48 hour uh, time frame that uh, we will require you to give us since we do review a lot of deals. So at least give us that time frame. All right. Okay, here's an interesting one. What guarantees do you have as an investor operator that my funds will be safe if I were to invest with your company? Well, first off, I can't give you any guarantees. Why? Because it's an investment at the end of the day. So there is no guarantees. And anyone, in my opinion, that gives you a guarantee on the type of return that you can get or guarantees that your money is going to be safe, in my opinion, is full of it, right? Uh, because it, you don't know what can happen, right? So it, it, it is the market and you don't know what can happen. But what we do is, and what I can guarantee you on, is we do have certain procedures in place to go ahead and minimize risk, certain strategies that we've implemented so that way our capital investors are protected. One of the biggest ways is uh, we understand market conditions. Uh, we understand what's going on. We know how to buy right. Our construction team is very good. We have a project manager on payroll that we pay that specializes in construction, and uh, and we have multiple. We have total four crews that we rotate so we have a pretty big solid team when it comes to construction and our track record speaks for itself and on top of that we protect your interest by obviously having you as a a, a loss payee on our uh, blanket uh, flipping policy that we have the uh, the fire policy that we have so that way you are protected we have a million uh, million liability policy and a two million aggregate liability policy on this or at least you're protected there and for fire insurance and what the replacement cost and when it comes to fire policy our replacement Placement cost is based on our future flip out value, not on our acquisition, which is another thing that you need to focus on also. And then on top of that, uh, we give our investors a back office login, meaning that uh, we give them a login to see what stages and what pictures of their Basically, let me rephrase, what stages that uh, it's going on in the construction, meaning every week we'll, we'll go ahead and show you pictures on what's happening with the project. And so that way you can log in and see what's going on. So a lot of our investors that we've worked with, the capital investors that we work with, they really love that function about uh, our company and what we do. Why? Because we actually really show you what's going on and you get to really get engaged and see what's happening uh, within the actual uh, transaction itself and watch the property come to. Uh, life essentially from ugly to pretty and on top of that uh, uh, that allows some of the investors who used to do flips on their own were doing some flips but now they can go ahead and do flips uh, without actually doing it themselves why because they're getting engaged on what's happening with the deals and so forth so it's a it's a way that we can go ahead and give more control over to uh, the actual uh, investors or private capital investors mm-hmm now, same gentleman asked again, you're not answering my question, the guarantee portion. Well, I understand that, you know, the guarantee, there is none because something can happen where the we go to war or something and boom, instantaneously, everything is lost, right? But what we do also is because we believe in it, you know, our company will guarantee it, but also we personally guarantee it as operators, the principles of the company that we're going to pay back the debt. So that's one thing that we do do uh, with our private investors because we believe in it. And also uh, because of that, uh, we'll go ahead and personally guarantee it also now the big thing is this is that is that you know at the end of the day you know it is an investment so um, you know the debt in itself is going to be repaid one way or another but also at the same time it's it's for you to be able to leverage your capital and be able to go ahead and have security and it all comes into negotiation with us in terms of what we feel comfortable with you because obviously if you have never done a funding with us uh, you know we may end up you know paying you maybe extra few points here and there just to build start building a relationship with you so you can see how we operate and then from there we may 
scale down your uh, returns as we've done with a lot of our investors once they see how we operate because you can see that hey you know what uh, uh, it is it is a means of getting returns on your capital so I hope that answered your question. All right, so here's another one. Again, go just go directly to the web page uh, that's on there, uh, either on the screen or on the link somewhere on here, where it actually explains to you more in detail what private money investing is all about. Uh, we do actually have a, a special report that we created that actually breaks down what private capital investing, private money lending is all about, uh, that actually breaks down the basics and actually some of the advanced stuff that you need to know if you're going to be lending out capital, you know, things like the usury law and so forth, right? Uh, you want to make sure that you're not violating, uh, you know, becoming a broker if you're trying to broker capital and things like that. So those are some ways that you need to protect yourself so that way you're doing a legitimate business doing it the right way so that way you don't have a um, big big brother coming knock, knocking on your doors as, as they say so um, all right okay how many uh, projects do you have currently working right now uh, we have a total of 11 projects we have going on in different phases of construction right now in our business that we're doing and uh, um, here we go. They asked again, uh, how many wholesale deals do you do a month? Uh, we do anywhere from three to five in any given month. So we've actually scaled that down uh, as we've raised more capital. We've been buying more properties instead of wholesaling them. And on top of that, I just explained to you what's been going on with the market. So it's been more, becoming more increasingly more difficult to wholesale properties. So, uh, you know, it's just one of those things where, yeah, wholesaling is nice for cash flow purposes, but also uh, rehabbing is our core business and our core bloodline. And one question, do you recommend uh, us to buy rental properties uh, and use a company like that will go ahead and not quite sure what they're saying. Okay, but I think what they're asking is would you, would, would you recommend buying rental properties at this moment and single family homes as long as the management company is good, just like Warren Buffett said, right? Um, I, I would recommend it, absolutely. You know, I wouldn't say no to it. But also at the same time, just keep in mind that, uh, you know, what type of yield are you getting, right? Because as an investor, you always have to look at the type of uh, return that you're getting. Because if the yield that you're getting is 6 to 8%, and this window of opportunity when it comes to uh, this historic lows is only maybe two, three, maybe four years tops that's left, right? How many properties can you really acquire in two, three, four years? Versus if you can go ahead and... Uh, compound and grow uh, your capital much quicker because you're getting a yield of an annual return of you know 12 to 20 percent plus then that means that you're going to be able to double or triple your capital during that uh, uh, two three four years much quicker versus uh, having uh, rental portfolios right now obviously I'm not saying that you're not going to have other benefits on that because if you have a rental portfolio you're going to have depreciation credit you're building equity position uh, so forth and you can obviously leverage out of that with your equi equity positions to do more flips or to do to, to to lend out capital and so forth. So, you know, it depends on the actual investor. And that's what I always boil down to. It depends on your risk tolerance level as an investor. You know, how involved do you want to get on and get? And do you want to work with a company that's outside of California or do you want to work with someone locally here in Los Angeles? So it's totally up to you. So where are we located? Oh, we're located in Hollywood, California uh, right now. Mm -hmm. All right. So we see more questions coming in, but I know that this webinar has been going on uh, for quite a while now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shut it down. Um, so that way, if you have more questions or more information you need, feel free to get a hold of us. Here's the office line. Shoot us an email. OK, or better yet, I will try to go ahead and answer all your questions uh, after this. So you'll probably receive an email from me afterwards. Um, but if you have a question, feel free to contact me directly. And uh, as I stated, if you are interested in working with us, there should have been a link somewhere on this web page or this webinar that popped up. So that way you can get involved and find out what uh, we can do. Um, but uh, appreciate it uh, that you listened in. I know you could have been doing uh, something else, but you're 
you know, listening into this important, important call, important, important training call. So thank you so much. And till next time, this is Jeff Kogo with Capital Redevelopment Group, and I shall see you on our next training call. Take care and bye-bye.